please do share about Solutions House online um, with Solutions House, hashtag Solutions House, and also Climate Week NYC. And one of the things which I've just noticed is people are sharing our wonderful quotes, which are up on the wall. Um, one of these quotes, I think, is particularly relevant to the sessions we're about to have all this afternoon. And it's this one over here by Walt Disney, which is, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. One of the things which I notice happens a great deal across all of Climate Week is we get a lot of techno speak, we get a lot of conversations about the structure and the infrastructure, and that we don't get enough conversations about the story. And so this afternoon, we've got a whole set of fantastic events about, about the storytelling industries, their responsibility and their footprint, but also how we can begin to be inspired by, as storytellers ourselves, inspired by climate solutions. And all this content has been enabled because of the new partner in Solutions House. So Solutions House has been a partnership of Futera with the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and Google for the past two years. And this year, we invite, we've um, been so, so, so lucky to have the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance come and join us as our fourth convening partner. So can we give them a round of applause? So Sam, tell us about, a bit about SCA. Yeah, uh, my name is Sam Reed. I am the executive director of the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance. We are an industry alliance of studios and streamers and other stakeholders working to reduce our industry's environmental footprint while also supporting a sustainable future on screen. Um, so very excited about the programming that we have today. And I just want to start by giving a huge thank you to Solly and her team here at Solutions House for having us. This is a beautiful space and I think it's going to be some very incredible conversations today. Um, so it's great. Yeah. Do you want me to intro? Yeah, let's get, let's get intro. Great, so we can have our, our first panel come up. Um, I will introduce them. Uh, Sean Hoyt, Hoyt is our moderator. Uh, Sean is the head of Clean Energy Networks at Con Edison uh, and also a adjunct professor at Columbia University and the director of the Sustainability Energy and Entertainment Network at Columbia's Climate School. Uh, we have Audrey Vinet Tang, who is the Senior Director of Sustainability Strategy at NBC Universal, responsible for the company's roadmap to carbon neutral by 2035 across studios, theme parks, and offices. We have Mary Jo Winkler, uh, an Emmy-nominated film and television producer, recently executive produced HBO's True Detective Night Country, amongst many other credits, uh, but also as a co-chair of the PGA Sustainable Task Force, as well as a co-chair of the DGA Sustainable Future Committee, so a true sustainability champion. Uh, and then we have Caroline Winslow, who is the Clean Energy Technologies Manager at Third Derivative, RMI's tech and innovation program, uh, leading work to develop innovative climate solutions, including for the entertainment industry and the Clean Mobile Power Initiative. Uh, and then Emma Stewart is the inaugural Netflix Sustainability Officer, where she leads the cross-company effort to decarbonize operations at the speed prescribed by climate science, support creators who choose to represent sustainability in their films, series, and games, and spotlight sustainability stories for the hundreds of millions of members who seek them. So, Sean, I will turn it over to you. Thank you all. Thank you, Sam. Welcome, everyone, to our session in person and those that are streaming online. I am thrilled to share this stage with such a distinguished group of successful individuals and professionals right here today. Before we begin, I'd like to also thank the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance, Puchera, and their partners for making this conversation possible during Climate Week NYC. In science fiction and movies, we use energy as a catalyst for transformative change and that shapes civilizations. Think of the spice melange in Dune or the dithium crystals in, in um, Star Trek. Or how about the Infinity Stones in the Avengers? And who could forget about the force in Star Wars? May the force be with us all given the climate crisis. <laughs> Clean energy has similar transformative potential. It reshapes communities, politics, and daily life. It's not just about the watts and kilowatt hours, it's also about empowering communities, reducing inequality, and reimagining our relationship with the planet. As someone deeply rooted in energy and sustainability, it is my work and my goal to really develop solutions for an equitable clean energy transition. Today, we'll hear from experts in the TV, film, and production industry and how their sustainability efforts are, faith, are, are influencing millions of people worldwide. So to set the stage off, I'd like to start with you, Audrey, since you're sitting right next to me. Nice to see you. Um, NBC is a powerful organization known for its, its extensive reach and influence in the media industry. 
Can you give us a broad overview of the current environmental impact of the film and television production? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so just to kind of set the stage, uh, entertainment companies are very similar to, to a lot of companies in terms of, you know, we have offices, data centers, buildings, um, which tend to kind of, in terms of emissions, consume energy um, about 70% of our scope one and two emissions, for those who like jargon or operational emissions, um, tend to come from electricity when we're thinking about buildings. Um, but uh, what do we think about film and TV production? It's actually flipped. So the majority of emissions come from fuel, um, mostly fuel to move things like vehicles for people and materials, um, fuel that goes in generators that powers our equipment when we're not on stage. Um, and so that really makes it a lot more challenging because for electricity, we have renewable energy purchasing, which is a, a more straightforward way of addressing those emissions. But when we think about fuel emissions, it's, you know, every single, uh, you know, gallon that we consume counts and, and it, it's a lot more complicated. Um, and so for those who want to know a little bit more about production emissions and, and what the breakdown of those look like, um, in 2021, the now Sustainable Entertainment Alliance uh, published industry benchmarks. Um, and those are available on greenproductionguide.com or the newly minted sustainableentertainmentalliance.org. Um, for those of you who want to dig deeper into the data, there's uh, what does the emissions look like by uh, both production type, but also production budgets and, and things like that. So. Lots of great data there. Um, and so at, at NBC Universal, we really kind of think of three key areas for addressing our environmental footprint. Um, so the first one is reducing energy use and, uh, and emissions because of that aforementioned data that tells us that that's what we need to address. Um, and so we've set the goal to be carbon neutral by 2035 um, across scopes one and two emissions. Um, and we have actually to date reduced emissions by 30%. Uh, compared to 2019, largely from renewable energy purchases. Um, the second one is we think about conserving um, materials and, and increasing circularity. So um, if you've ever been on a set, you know, you kind of see a lot of different ways that there, there is waste. And so um, either it's thinking about plastics at catering um, to things as large as sets in the worlds that we build and, and how do we reuse those materials or how do we source those materials in a more responsible way. Um, at NBCU, we actually have asset centers in LA, here in New York, and in Miami um, that our TV productions can use at no cost to them, and they can take out set walls, props, wardrobe, um, you name it, and 100% of those materials go back at rack, um, so creating that kind of circular system. Um, and then the third one is we think about um, inspiring and engaging our audiences. So, um, you know, although we, you know, as a company that makes a mostly digital product. Um, and if you think about it, a good movie is highly rewatchable or highly reusable. Um, you know, we have an outsized impact on audiences and, and um, on the content that we make. But there's a panel after us that's going to address that, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But my colleague, uh, Kimberly Burnick, who I don't know where she is here, but um, uh, she's going to talk a little bit more about the Greener Light program at NBC Universal that thinks about uh, integrating sustainability from script to screen. Um, so really thinking about uh, the content side of things. Thank you, Audrey. So on the topic of reusable movies, if that's a, a new term, <laughs> um, I'd like to jump over to you, Emma. And if I'm allowed to ask, um, are you allowed to tell me what your favorite show on Netflix is? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> uh, but I will. Although I was told that I was a little too spicy on my earlier panel, so I'm going to try and tone it down a bit. Um, can my kids get a vote, too? Whatever you like. Okay, they like Family Switch, which, if you haven't seen it, is a hilarious film starring Jennifer Gardner. And the fun thing about that one is the production really embraced uh, electric vehicles on set. And then as part of our EVs on screen commitment uh, with GM, uh, the main character pulls up in a Polestar multiple times over and has multiple dialogue moments over her charger, um, which gets me quite excited, uh, as do my children, because they're the ones in charge of plugging in our electric vehicle. I would say right now my favorite is probably Virgin River. Um, which is well into its uh, sixth season. And there it's been a wonderful example of how clean technology adoption comes in iterations. 
right? So we really started out um, supporting them through our regional sustainability advisor up in British Columbia. Uh, you have uh, a nice enabling environment there where uh, the provincial government actually uh, discounts film permits for those who are cleaning up their production act. Uh, and then we had enough access to clean technology like medium-sized batteries, uh, hydrogen, and electric vehicles that that production could really start embracing it. And with each subsequent season, they've dug in more and more to the point where they've halved their fuel use, um, which is saying something in an industry that has been doing this with diesel generators and diesel trucks for the better part of a century. Um, there's also fun aspects of that show in the sense that we support uh, the writers on that show and the recent season uh, features, unfortunately, a, a number of wildfire scenes that are really central to the plot. And so we were able to bring in creative support and research support um, on screen as well. Thank you for that. And, and now I'm gonna get to my real question. Okay. Um, so um, for all the ice cream lovers in the audience, Ben and Jerry's put out a case study, a marketing effort that was entitled Endangered Pites. And the whole premise behind it is just to really demonstrate that if all of the cocoa and peanuts are wiped off the face of the planet because of deforestation and climate change, that your favorite pint of ice cream may be endangered of becoming extinct. And it really piqued the interest of the audience that really care about their flavor of ice cream. So my question to you was, it, it, are these shows in danger of becoming extinct? Or why should the audience care about sustainable TV and production? Yeah, maybe we need a CITES list for uh, productions, right? Endangered animals. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've had a number of productions report back to us uh, some meaningful impacts from the effects of climate change. Perhaps the most memorable uh, was in Rebel Moon, um, which happily was able to go off grid uh, outside of Los Angeles, <clears throat> but still use uh, electricity uh, through mobile batteries for 73 days of construction um, to construct that set. Um, but there was a strange quirk in that we needed a wheat field. Um, those of you who have seen it will remember it's really central to the plot. Um, and the wheat did not grow as predicted because the seasons were different um, than they were had been modeled. Um, similarly, unfortunately, many studios saw impacts from the massive floods in southern Brazil um, and, you know, cast and crew alike affected by that. So I wouldn't necessarily declare them on the CITES endangered list yet, um, but I think it's very much top of mind. Thank you, Emma. And Mary Jo, I'm, I'm going to kick it over to you now as Emma spoke about things that could happen on set. So i um, big fan of True Detective, just big disclaimer there. Uh, so Night Country has been praised for its atmospheric setting, right? strong performance, and engaging storyline. Can you walk us through a typical day on set from a sustainability perspective, filming it? Sure. Before I do that, I will just talk a little bit about the decision to shoot in Iceland yeah. um, and some of the things that go into the decision making. Uh, what can help with sustainability is evaluate. You know, we needed to reflect the high Arctic of Alaska. Alaska was inhospitable. The high Arctic is inhospitable to cast and crew, and you can't really fly there. You can, it's very hard to get to. Um, we evaluated parts of Canada. Um, the decision to go to Iceland was a sustainable one because um, there was a infrastructure and a crew base and snow and ice and dark and everything that we needed within a 30 minute drive of uh, the city center of Reykjavik. In addition, the entire country is run on 100% clean energy, 63% geothermal, and the rest is hydroelectric. So when I found that out, it was um, a slam dunk. And in uh, collaboration with Heidi Kimberg, who is the director of sustainability at HBO, uh, we did a lot of evaluating. You still have to bring a fair amount of people into, um, into Iceland, but it was a lot less than we would have if we went elsewhere. So. That, I, I like to talk about that because it's something that is really important when you're evaluating where to shoot, how to shoot. Um, then the cut to a typical day, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, before we go to a day on set, we're gonna talk a little bit about the setup because what I typically do as a producer is I talk to every single department head uh, on a production and talk about what um, our goals 
should be or could be for a sustainability plan for the production. And I asked for collaboration from the crew. And that's a really important thing to communicate what your plan and your goals will be. And it is a way, it's also a way to sort of engage uh, your cast and crew and, um, and amazing ideas come out of that. So we um, cut to set, you know, um, well, I'm not gonna cut to set yet because there's a lot that goes into planning, but we um, looked at our environment. We came up with a plan based on where we were. We were very fortunate to have over 40 EV vehicles, uh, saved about 15,000 liters of gasoline by um, driving those EV vehicles. Uh, we had a cast and crew that was in, very engaged and also a, envir you know, conserv conservation and environmentalism is a way of life living in such a natural environment. So we, we had lots of dialogue. We looked at materials, we looked at energy. Biggest you know, thing was looking at energy. We were very lucky that our, set, we, our interior locations on stage and a lot of locations we were able to tie into the clean energy grid. So that was a, that was a blessing. We, they're still, our trucking is still not um, electric in, in um, Iceland, but we were able to um, uh, you know, conserve as much as possible. We also found an electric battery uh, we, that acted as a generator and we used that for, uh, to, to power our catering and craft service. We nicknamed it the Benerator oh, yeah. and it was a big source of conversation. A lot of departments were charging their batteries on it. We used a lot of medium size and small batteries um, on set. We, uh, we um, you know, looked at all of our waste, we composted, we recycled. Um, the, the Icelanders don't really throw anything away. They don't like to, that they're on an island and they like to hold on to things. So we looked at materials um, that, were, that we could reuse and recycle. We also approached designing the sets with a circularity in mind. So we turned ice, we'd shoot a set out and then turn it into another set. And all of that was looked at in the design um, process. And then, you know, the crew had, you know, low hanging fruit. We had no single use plastic water bottles on our set. We had, um, you know, we, uh, like I said, camp catering and craft service was powered by an electric battery. Um, and, you know, we shot in a lot of natural environments and really just tried to take care of those environments the best we can. And a really fun thing that happened in pre-production, um, Jody Foster, uh, wanted to um, just have a moment with the cast and Issa and myself and we, uh, she decided that we were going to plant trees. And it was a beautiful sort of ritual that we did and we planted, um, you know, there aren't a lot of trees in Iceland. So we planted, we did a tree planting and we're convinced that that tree planting, giving to the universe was a way for the universe to give back to us. And we had all of the snow and the ice and the, and the darkness and not a single weather issue on the entire show. It is, it is so fascinating because as, as a customer, as a consumer, as, so, as a fan of TV and production, you wouldn't necessarily think that all of this is happening behind the scenes. And when preparing for this panel, I did my research and I, I found a short clip about your efforts. Can you talk about how you're communicating? Yes, that? yes. So we, along the way, we had um, behind the scenes, you know, we had our BTS crew just shooting footage. We um, interviewed everyone, and in collaboration with Heidi, um, we sort of, you know, decided that we were going to do a behind-the-scenes video. So it's a pretty comprehensive video of the measures that we took in our sustainability efforts. It also showed that, you know, our entire cast and crew was really supportive, and I do believe that when you bring sustainability into a production, it forms community. And just the idea of talking about it, engaging with it, um, implementing it, and the successes of it are really important. And it's important to communicate early and often throughout the show what your, what your successes are, and then to culminate with a piece that can show everybody else what we did is a very powerful form of messaging. Yeah, my vote is to include it on the trailer because it will make people watch it 10 times over. Um, 
So, Caroline, I'm going to jump to you. We heard Audrey mention that the, um, across future films, the biggest carbon producer is in the transportation through, through um, fossil fuels. All right. Um, Decarbonizing production is, is going to require innovation. Can you talk to some of the innovations that you've seen from Third Derivative or what you're working on in this space? Yeah, definitely. So fuel on a set um, has massive impact, both both for transportation as well as powering diesel generators, um, unless you're in Iceland and can tap into geothermal and hydro there. Um, but before looking at how to power the different requirements on a set, I think first and foremost, we like to start with energy efficiency. So where can you reduce the demand for power across a set? That can be things like trailers that are powered with solar. Ideally, those have super efficient HVAC systems in them. So whether you're in a hot or cold climate, the cooling or heating is not drawing significantly. You can put in smart um, systems, something like you know a Nest to be really monitoring heating and cooling only when required, um, using LED lighting for example. So there's a lot of opportunities to leverage existing proven technologies to draw down that demand. Based on our analysis, um, with current technologies available in the market, there's about 30% opportunity to reduce that energy consumption. Then with the remaining power, um, which we've heard some of the technologies mentioned today, we found that kind of the optimal solution set to replace diesel generators are either battery energy storage systems um, hydrogen power units, or some are hybridized systems and use the two in tandem. And what's really cool about these is they have the potential to be zero emissions power. So for battery, if you plug it into a grid that's fully charged for your renewables, that's a zero emissions power solution. And then hydrogen power units, if they're powered with green hydrogen, which is produced using renewables, um, that has zero emissions potential as well and is uh, Fascinating for those that aren't familiar, it essentially splits hydrogen and the byproduct is fresh water. I know Shannon's drink, drinking some water that's come straight out of the tap of a hydrogen power unit before. But so we, together with Netflix and Disney, um, launched what's called the Clean Mobile Power Initiative because we heard from the industry that while there were some solutions out there, there weren't any uh, clean mobile power solutions at the scale required for the industry or that met your guys' unique mobility or size or power requirements. So through that, we've launched a broader initiative that's working um, both with studios and streamers like Netflix and Disney, as well as supplier partners we've just brought on to help with the distribution, uh, which includes MBS Group, QOT by Sunset Studios, and uh, Sunbelt Rentals. And then third derivative, we are a startup accelerator program. So we've brought on 10 companies that have either these hydrogen power unit, battery, or hybridized systems that can really deploy units that meet the needs of the industry. So we're working closely with them as well as all the partners I noted to really test these solutions, um, bring them to productions and market. And we're really focused on that you know, medium to large scale. Um, so specifically, you know, 300 kilowatt hour units with 90 kilowatts of power that can be pulled behind a trailer um, and hopefully, you know, deploy here quickly. We're gonna be doing testing over the next eight or so months. So hopefully they'll be more readily available to be utilized um, in productions. So Caroline, we're gonna need some additional nicknames. Maybe you team up with Mary Jo to get better, better rate or some, <laughs> some other friends. Um, on the topic of energy, that's obviously the industry that I'm most familiar with. Um, what types of technologies are you seeing, Mary Jo, or Caroline, or sorry, Emma, rather? What, what types of technologies are you looking at on set? And what kind of are the drivers? In New York State, we have one of the most ambitious climate laws at the state level called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which sets goals and targets for New York State to hit its carbon reduction goals. Um, and at Con Edison, we provide financial incentives to our customers so that they are able to adopt these technologies that Caroline was talking about. Um, the energy efficiency technologies ranging from lighting to refrigeration to controls to clean heat technologies through heat pumps, as well as geothermal. All right, but what are you seeing on set? Because these sets are, are, are microcosms of the entertainment industry. Yeah, I think we're seeing the need for, uh, to accelerate uh, clean mobile power, um, the ability to use clean mobile power on our sets, it's it's somewhat fragmented right now in that there's bits and pieces. We're in we're in a transition. We'd like to get out of the transition and make it, you know, a mainstay, because there's bits and pieces of 
batteries and solar trailers and um, you know piloting different generators and hydrogen and all of those things, but it needs to be consistent and it needs to be, we need it on a mass scale. We really need to accelerate uh, that if we're going to make a dent. I mean, there, you know, right now what we're doing is we're making clean mobile power plans with our crews and our department heads and talking to cinematographers about using LEDs and bringing down our, you know, only taking what we need. Um, there is renewable diesel in New York. We love to be using clean mobile power. Yeah, and actually to add on that, I think one of the biggest issues that we're seeing is that for the things that do exist on the market, like smaller battery units or solar power trailers, in some of the filming markets where we are, I mean, you can count on one hand the number of pieces of equipment that exist yeah. there that are available for rental. Um, so one of the things that we've done at NBC Universal is we've long had our sustainable production program where we embed sustainability um, across our onset protocols um, on over 70 productions a year. Um, but oh, recently, earlier this year, we um, rolled out the sustainable production standards where we really um, essentially require specific metrics are hit on uh, production to, to ensure that we're investing in this clean technology. Um, and so that's currently um, required across all of our feature films. Um, and then we're piloting on, on some of our television series, but it's really to, to ensure that, you know, we're going beyond, you know, one unit, one kind of, you know, pilot unit and really kind of scaling availability and showing right. that there's a demand for it. And listen, I think producers will demand it. Yeah. I think the more producers demand it, the more supply will exist, the lower the cost, the, you know, but we do need, it's like at all forces, yeah. studio support, resources, metrics, yeah. you know, producers willing to, uh, to pilot or bring it into, onto their sets. And, um, but we do need, and, you know, even Con Ed, you know, power drops all over New York City that we could tie into, you know, things that we need access and we need it now. It's very urgent. I'm not supposed to be on that seat, but. <laughs> um, can I, just add, that, can I just add, it, right. we're, in a, we're in a transition as a society to a clean energy economy. And so it's, it's fun to look out and see a thousand flowers bloom. But I think if speed is of the essence, we have to organize our thinking. And so as my team knows, I'm a bit of a broken record about the order of operations in which we do things. So first, I'm so glad Caroline started with energy efficiency. You know, every megawatt is money back in our pocket. And so we really try and optimize first and foremost, but on production, that's sometimes difficult when budget and schedule are paramount. Um, but there's tons, whether it's the fleet schedule or the operating schedule, or even just something that seems so basic like LED lighting that has a myriad of benefits to the production that is kind of first principles. So start with optimize, then electrify, um, because electric motors are more efficient, so that's money back in our pocket. They break down less often, that's sanity back in our brains. And you also have the benefit of electricity as a grid slowly decarbonizing around us. So you're decarbonizing at source just by switching fuel sources. And so they're electrifying vehicles, and then also the auxiliary power um, is really important. And then lastly, you decarbonize what's left. So there are certain things you can't electrify right now, aviation being one of them, right? Um, and there are certain things that are taking longer to electrify, and so you need a bridge fuel, like a renewable diesel, um, like we're using in New York or, or in London. And so decarbonizing those liquid fuels that are very power intensive and are not necessarily conducive to near-term electrification um, is the last step stage. So we think of it as OED, optimize, electrify, decarbonize. And if you do things in that order, you will generally make your CFO happy. <laughs> if you do things in the reverse order, not so much. Thank you for that. Can I add one more thing while we're talking about Absolutely. technology? I think we're at Climate Week, we're all talking about how to reduce emissions. Um, but I think a key piece too is there's a lot of added benefits to these technologies we're talking about, both from a human health and safety. You know, those working on a set are not breathing in harmful pollutants coming out of a diesel generator. We've heard a lot of users, of especially battery systems, really excited about how silent and quiet they are. 
Um, they don't need long cable runs. They can be sitting directly below a camera. So there's a lot of added benefits to this transition as well, in addition to reducing uh, emissions. Agreed on all fronts. Um, I'll, I'll stick with you, Caroline. On the topic of scaling up and partnerships, what have you seen in, in the market so far? I mean, I think partnerships is, is the key word there. And as the Clean Mobile Power Initiative, I think is case in point of studios that are uh, maybe competitors like Netflix and Disney, but share the same supply chain of this equipment, really coming together and joining with other key industry players to say, how do we aggregate demand? How do we bring solutions to our market? Um, you know, a lot of the manufacturers we're working with have really strong footholds in the construction space or in military or disaster response and relief. And it's saying, come to our industry as well. Um, and I think partnerships is critical for that to really be demonstrating not only the, the power in the market signal, but from a deployment perspective, um, particularly in the film and TV industry, you, you know, most productions utilize the same suppliers. Um, so how do you get everyone on board and moving towards the same solutions together? So I think, yeah, partnerships is paramount. Yeah, and, and on the same topic of, of scaling up, Emma, you spoke about the CFO and make, keeping them happy. What are you seeing around things like cost and availability of the technology? I'm gonna give you a classic environmental answer. It depends. Uh, it depends on the situation. So if you have high mileage vehicles, then electrifying them puts money back in your pocket. You're saving on fuel. If you have low mileage vehicles, less so. Um, when it comes to batteries and hydrogen power units, uh, those tend to rent for more up front. So the rental rates might be more because the cost of this newer technology is being passed through to companies like Netflix, we don't own any of our equipment um, or any of the transportation vehicles on our productions. So in those instances, you know, we swallow that cost up front, um, but over time through maintenance benefits and some of the operational agility benefits that Caroline so nicely described, uh, we see business benefit, um, even if it's not necessarily direct to the bottom line. So one of the things that we have really found to be um, a, a kind of magic inducement is by burying into the standard production budget a line item for fuel reduction, called the fuel reduction allowance. Um, notice, no carbon, no sustainability, no grain in that title. It's all about the business benefit. And based upon the number of shoot weeks that a given production uh, represents, they're given a certain subsidy out of our sustainability budget. And I think the key aspect of this is they're not allowed to reallocate that tempting though that might be, because productions are always looking for where they can um, move money around to make the most of things. And so that has really been a game changer in terms of helping them overcome any upfront costs in those higher rental rates or higher leasing rates. Um, and what we're finding is that now productions like Stranger Things are, are coming to us and saying, we want to do more. So that's enough of an inducement to kind of get the ball rolling get the crew a little bit socialized to some of these technologies. Um, and then coupling that with the regional sustainability advisor, who's a former producer, who is able to speak the language of senior production staff and say, here's how you could benefit this shoot, or here's how you could get a shot you can't otherwise get if you use this battery instead of that generator. So the, the human and the financial combination um, has been really magical. And maybe just to add on the, the pricing financial piece, we're really hopeful as well that costs will continue to come down, that upfront cost of purchasing and renting the units. I think two main or three main factors. First is right through that demand aggregation and economies of scale as these companies grow, hopefully those costs will come down. Also, as we've seen just industry-wide, the cost of lithium-ion batteries have reduced 90% from 2010 to 2023. Um, so general trends. And then also in the kind of public policy space, there's a lot of opportunities. For example, California has a program called CORE that allows up to you know, tens, if not, I think tens of thousands of dollars um, in rebates to clean mobile power manufacturers. So there's a lot of kind of creative ways to combine these um, in addition to you all earmarking uh, additional funds for that to be driving down these costs and make them more feasible to use on production. All right, so we're gonna transition to audience Q&A in a 
couple of questions. So just start the balls rolling in your heads. Uh, for this one for you though, Audrey, I'm looking ahead. What does a fully sustainable production look like to you? Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I definitely think we've heard a lot of the solutions. So I think tying it all together, it's definitely a you know zero emissions uh, production where we're tying into a hopefully by then 100% renewable energy grid. Um, and, and we are you know driving electric vehicles. Um, we hopefully have electric heavy duty vehicles because I think you, you briefly mentioned that, but that's still a huge challenge today. Um, is, is having not only heavy duty transportation vehicles, which that whole sector is, is, is moving towards electrification, but um, being able to customize it for our needs uh, within the industry because we do need special vehicle types. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, Carolyn and team are gonna hopefully unlock that uh, large battery unit that we, we need for, for clean production power. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, that's definitely, you know, the kind of rosy vision, but um, you know, we also want to think about, you know, is it a healthier place? You know, we're offering, you know, food that, that people enjoy eating. Maybe it's locally produced food. Um, we're having composting and reusable dishware and, and just overall it's, it's a better place to work. Um, and it, it's a better quality, uh, of kind of a per, you know, environment, not just for the kind of areas where we're filming, but also for the crew. I got one question online that I, I think Mary Jo, you're well equipped to, to answer since you were just filming offsite. How can we make international productions work with local organizations to integrate culture barriers that this region has? That's a, I'm not sure what that, what the cultural barrier. There is not necessarily the cultural barriers, but when you go to Iceland, right, right and they're not throwing anything away. Yeah. and they're all renewable and you know, they're set with yes. fully sustainable. We're not seeing that here in the United States, right? So how could- Yes, well, it depends. We are seeing it if there's a willingness to, right. um, to, to work sustainably. I mean, that is one of the core tenants as you know, to look at all of your materials and look at your systems and not, try not to wait, you know, overdo everything. And some of that is actually, beneficial to the budget, you know, the, the, that sort of goes hand in hand. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question would be for, for Caroline, right? Do industries face similar challenges and what opportunities like the clean mobile power technologies that you're providing are available to them? Yeah, I think I alluded to this earlier based on where a lot of the companies we're working with right now um, are focused, but there's tons of spillover potential of these solutions into other industries. I mean, as I'm sure all of us see walking down the street here, there's a lot of diesel generators parked for construction. So construction's a huge one. Um, things like, yeah, disaster response and relief um, after, say, a large hurricane or disaster, bringing power in there to support with relief efforts is large, um, military, live events and festivals. The list really goes on. Anywhere where you see a large diesel generator, these solutions can serve in place of that. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? A lot of hands, oof. Uh, you in the front, please. Sure, yeah, thank you so much. This is really fascinating. Um, what are some of the relevant certification themes or claims that are going to pertain to TV and film? So something that you all are looking at setting a science-based target or carbon neutral, um, what's relevant to your work? I can take that one. I see Audrey peering at me, so I think I've laughed too. Um, so Netflix got a late start. Um, we only ran our first carbon footprint in late 2020, um, believe it or not. Uh, but six months later, uh, we had understood that footprint, set a science-based target, got it validated um, by SBTI. Uh, sorry, I skipped the internal audit and the external audit. Those were the really painful parts. Um, and announced it. So six months, that's doable if you move fast and you have someone like Reed Hastings at the helm, uh, who was personally in our carbon footprint looking at the numbers, which pleased me. Um, and so that is very appropriate. In fact, it's kind of becoming table stakes for companies nowadays to, to set um, a science-based target, which essentially means that you're having, H-A-L-V-I-N-G, your emissions between now and um, 2030, or more realistically, a 2019 or 2020 baseline. 
And that is because what the climate science says is that the world needs to have emissions every day, decade between now and 2050, and then it needs to tackle all residual emissions through removals um, by 2050. We decided to take an additional approach because a close read of the science shows that this decade matters more than next decade, which matters more than the subsequent decades. So we'd rather front load our action rather than wait until we were you know, deeply decarbonized and the world around us was solving for these problems. So on top of our decarbonization science-based target, we also match all remaining emissions across all three scopes using high quality nature-based uh, carbon credits and or the destru destruction of methane, which for those of you who are uh, carbon accounting wonks know is up to 80 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon that everyone talks about. So um, in our minds, that really kind of is a transposition of the science onto an organization like Netflix. And I'll just add that, so as, as a company, um, you can set a science-based target, um, but then if you're looking on your film and TV productions individually for certifications, there are a number of um, frameworks out there. So Albert in the UK has a certification where there's essentially like a checklist that you go through. Um, and then here in the US, there's the Environmental Media Association has the Golden Green Seal Awards, which is similar, you kind of can go through and check off what you've done during production and get a seal. Uh, uh, someone over, the gentleman in, in straight ahead. Uh. Hello, I'm Thomas with the Sustainability Strategist. Thank you for sharing your insights. I'm curious about financing side of this. So if we look at raising capital or even debt for some of these productions, or it may even be in the case of NBC or Netflix, your own investors uh, and lenders, how do you see this impact your access to financing? Are they, is this enabling greater access to financing or are investors skeptical? Can I take that one? We, we get interest from investors on these topics. Um, so we get phone calls every few weeks asking uh, what we're up to. Um, and we've looked at you know, green bonds, sustainability linked bonds. We kind of understand the marketplace. Um, we as a company don't necessarily struggle to, to raise. So we're in a nice position in that sense. But know that our investors are definitely asking and they're definitely reading our ESG report, um, and we regularly engage with them as well as our banks um, to make sure that we know what they're up to. Gentlemen, straight ahead. Right in my line of sight. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, I just wondered what role you see virtual production having going forwards, and what are some of the opportunities and issues with that? So we operate a few virtual production sound stages. There definitely are benefits for um, especially short-term locations where you don't need to travel people to you know, a faraway place and you can just capture the image and then shoot on a sound stage, um, hopefully you know, running on renewable energy. Um, there, you know, actually the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance, to plug the website one more time, <laughs> greenproductionguide.com or sustainableentertainmentalliance.org, <laughs> um, <laughs> a, uh, a report uh, on the life cycle emissions of uh, virtual production, um, kind of comparing both, you know, you do save on the material side of things, but then there's obviously the digital footprint of rendering and, and all of that. And so, um, there's some, some interesting data out there, but it, it essentially, it depends, as Emma said, um, on what you're replacing with the virtual production. All right, um, well, far in the back, the back one doesn't get enough respect. Hi. Um, I, forgive me, I think Audrey uh, brought this up, but it was really interesting to hear about that you have kind of like a bank of resources for people with like set needs. Um, if, that, if I'm correct, and I'm wondering, um, not to put you on the spot, but how often that resource is used, and there's a couple like mini questions included in that. If it's not being utilized, is it at risk for closing? Because I think it's a beautiful like solution. And then the last part of that question is, do you have any like, if it's not being utilized as as in hoped, do you have any like crazy moonshot ideas? to get people more excited about using your resources from that bank? 
Yeah, so it is used uh, on all television productions at NBC. So they always essentially shop the asset warehouse first um, and, and get everything they can. And really has everything, I mean, even like desks and office furniture, um, anything you can, you can use. And so you go there first and then you look for what you can't find later. Um, and then as long as you bring everything back to kind of create that cycle. Um, but I will say the team there is thinking about things like how do they create a digital inventory of what they have to make it easier. For, you know, everyone likes to online shop now instead of physically shop. Um, so, so things like along those lines. But, but no, it is definitely used on on all production. And so, yeah, yep, yeah, in the back. Um, oh wow, that that came out hot. Um, so a few of you have mentioned that you've got a lot of. Um, interactivity with your crew and, and the various people who actually take part in making these productions happen. But how much are you explicitly designing programs to either just empower, encourage, and say, this is a celebrated part of becoming more sustainable within uh, production as a whole? That's a great question. One of the things we did with Third Derivative um, and the unions um, in Los Angeles was hosted a, a demo day uh, so this was Disney and Netflix and Third Derivative uh, and a number of unions. And we really kind of tried to step ourselves into the curtains and let the unions lead and invite their membership. Uh, we were turning people away. It was completely oversubscribed. Um, and it was over the course of actually two days, uh, we had hundreds of crew quite literally kicking the tires on this tech or quite literally getting behind the wheel. Um, and I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see crew say, this stuff is real, I can touch it. Um, and regularly, our running joke at the office is they would say, can you please turn it on? They'd be like, no, it, it's on. <laughs> um, and so that really conforms to what we hear anecdotally from set is that the, the, the sound benefits of this in many cases are so welcome by the crew. Um, and so it really, as Audrey was saying, is an enhancement to their office, which is the set. Yeah, yeah if I can add to that, yeah, um, just from a producing standpoint, um, the Producers Guild of America has an inter-guild alliance, and um, we have started hearing from crew members, a lot of the unions now have sustainability committees because there has been an uprising and a, a, an acknowledgement of the world we're living in and the desire to be on a cleaner uh, less toxic in a cleaner, less toxic environment all around. So um, there's a lot of communication around that, hence the reaction to the um, demo day. And, um, and there's a lot of resources out there for, uh, for individuals, for crew members. The DGA has a pro tips, um, a sustainability pro tips that you can go online and uh, look at now that has in, that's very intuitive and instructional and there's a lot of growing resources on the green production guide um, and Albert so uh, there's been a, a quite a groundswell yeah actually I was at a session yesterday with Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and um, I don't know if you were well you're nodding maybe you were there too <laughs> um, but uh, she said this amazing thing about how she, she was talking about induction stoves and electric heat pumps but um, when you're, you know, ha you know, talking to people about retrofitting or changing things out, not approaching it like you're sacrificing something to do the greener thing, but it's actually an upgrade, right? It's a, it's a cooler technology, it's a newer technology, um, and, and we're hearing that from crews as well. Um, a lot of my team members have told me, you know, they've said that a lot of crews say, oh, when we have an electric uh, battery on our set instead of a generator, you know, it's like we got this new cool kind of like toy to play with. Like we often feel like we get sort of the leftover equipment from other industries. Um, and so it's actually a really exciting thing for someone to learn um, and, and, and yeah, and, and have something cool, which in the entertainment industry, I think we should never underestimate the power of something being cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, um, listen, the science informs us with the knowledge about climate change. But as you've heard, it's the stories that, it's the stories that force us to care, right? And it may seem like the problem was too big to solve, but as we open up, it's kind of fun to do the impossible, right? Um, please give them a round of applause.